Hey everybody, it's Jack Rita with Future Pastimes. I'm one of the designers on the expansions for the classic Dune board game. And this is Battle Language, where we have a roundtable discussion. So we're going to be talking about um, one of the original factions, a little bit of strategy, a little bit of insight, and maybe some interesting stories. Uh, it's the Emperor. And uh, we are joined by our, our usual uh, panel uh, superstars, GJ and Jaded. And we have a special guest. We have the uh, the funky grognard himself, Chris Lahr, who is one of the mods on the Facebook Dune board game uh, page. And he posts a lot of really good strategy tips on playing the different factions that you can find on Board Game Geek and possibly other places as well. I don't venture far from Board Game Geek myself, so there will be links to uh, some of that stuff in the description. Um, and uh, yeah, welcome, Chris. It's good to have you uh, as part of our panel. Thank you very much. It's really good to be here. Yeah, we uh, so we know from your recent uh, favorite five factions that the Emperor is at the top of the list. And uh, and you mentioned before we started recording that it's at the bottom of my, my list. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's it's like I think a lot of us have said this, you know, we, and you were talking about your bottom five. You're like you still like uh, all the factions. And that, that's definitely true for me. Um, I think the one of the reasons why the Emperor is the bottom faction for me is uh, probably hand in hand with the, you know, what what faction do you give to a brand new player? Um, just because it's so easy for them to grasp and there's not a lot they have to think about too hard. And that's the Emperor. And I, and I think that that's probably true. If you have somebody who is new, that's a good faction for them to start with, because there's only two things. If you're even if you, you know, if you're even playing advanced, there's only two things to keep track of and if you're playing basic there's only one uh and it it's uh it's also good to just have a lot of spice even if especially if you're new just because it opens up a lot of possibilities you're not uh struggling as many uh, as many of the other players often are um, so i i'm actually looking forward to a lot of the extra nuances that the other factions bring and so that's really the main reason why it isn't there but i i think with other uh, variants involved that changes, and I mentioned if we're using home worlds, the emperor goes to the top of my list because the emperor has two home worlds, and I like that a lot. He's got Kaitane for his regular forces, Seleucus Secundus for the Sardaukar, and uh, some special rules involved in there. So um, I, I I do enjoy the emperor, and I like playing it. But let's you know let's check in. So GJ, uh, what about you? How does the emperor fall in your uh, list of the twelve factions in terms of your joy and um, likelihood to choose it if given uh, an option i think it's perfectly in the middle it's <laughs> nothing i would absolutely jump on if i had the chance but i will never really turn it down it's simple to play it gives a lot of different options it allows a little more mindless thinking you have you're rich if you can spend overspend one or two spice it's not really the end of the world but I do also enjoy that with little more challenging and spicy stuff that other fashions can do. I really enjoy giving Emperor to someone that's new. It's the perfect fashion for me, at least. Yeah. To let a new player get in the game, be relatively safe, but still feel like doing something. Because who the hell does not want to get paid? That just always feels good and people really, really like that part of it, especially. Jader, what about you? How did, where does Emperor fall for you? Well, I haven't been shy about saying how Ekaz is my number one, <laughs> but recently Emperor has actually kicked Thylaxu down from the number two slot and taken it himself. Oh, uh, only a couple of months ago did I really start playing them because I kind of wrote them off as, for all the reasons you guys gave, only two advantages, your advantages are just being rich, but playing them more, I realized that Spice is interwoven in basically every system in the game. So having the most of it all the time means that there's such a wide array of strategies you can employ just through the sheer fact of having a lot of spice. And I've found them really interesting to play lately and really strong too. Pawinda, it didn't help you out yesterday <laughs> in our game. Uh, all right, Chris, <laughs> let's go back to you. Um, why don't you uh, fill us in on again on, on some of your reasons why the Emperor is your number one go-to guy. Well, I feel like that a lot of people feel that the Emperor 
is simple. And in many ways, the emperor is for reasons you stated. They only have two real powers. They get all the spice from bidding, except for when Richess is up for bid. And they get the starter card in the advanced game, which is the only way to play. But for me, despite that simplicity, I find it a challenge to try to pull as much nuance out of those two advantages. And a big one for me came with the 2020 FAQ, which basically stated that the Emperor can give spice away for any reason, and it's immediately available uh, instead of just going in front of the shield. And right. that gives the Emperor a lot of power in terms of how they want to leverage that massive amount of spice. And in one of my recent games on Discord, I won the game uh, because I was able to maintain two half of the strongholds. And in every battle I got into, I just paid my way out, didn't have to sacrifice my troops. It didn't affect me economically. And to me, that's the way to play the Emperor. You know, beaming down the Sardaukar should be your last ditch effort. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree 100 percent. And I like that approach. And I, and I don't see it employed as often as you might think, although maybe after this, more and more people will do it. But the fact that you can bribe people to just throw the battle your way. In fact, you can bribe them to just come in and even have a battle. So somebody who's going early in this in the turn order, you know, if you've got a stronghold or two as the emperor, and you can say, look, you know, I, I will make a binding deal with you to not go for the win uh, on this turn or if that's what it takes. But you can say, look, there's five or six spice. If you throw the battle here, I won't kill your leader. Um, just send in one force. And uh, I'll, in fact, I'll throw in two extra spice. So if you need to pay to revive that force, you're really not uh, out anything there. And um, it really lets you... Um, bide your time and strike when the conditions are right because a lot of times you're waiting for you're waiting for a certain position of the storm so that you know that you can strike uh, early enough and late enough in the turn order for the shipping and movement phase and so yeah chris i i think that that's you know that that opening of the uh you know well that that sharing of the spice i mean that that's an ally privilege only their bribing of other people is still bribe like anything else, but just the fact that they can bribe so often and so readily is um, is really pretty powerful. And um, as Jade had said, they they are they're constantly uh, flush with spice. Uh, it's pretty unusual for the emperor to be on Chome Charity, and um, and <laughs> and it's sad when it does happen, but they're not going to be on it for long, even if it does. And I think with that alliance ability, you know, when you can loan your ally spice in battle to beef up their troops or to help with their revivals, which is also one of their alliance uh, powers, or for any reason, that's, that's tremendously powerful that other factions can't do. Usually it's just loaning spice for shipment and treachery cards. And with the Emperor, they can give it for any reason to their ally and it's immediately available and that that's a tr basically you can end up with two very wealthy factions by default of the emperor alone. Yeah, yeah. Most other alliances, you're you're really limited. You can help your ally pay for a treachery card. You can help them by paying for shipping, um, but you can't just give them spice, and you can't help them with their revivals. And uh, and as little as that seems for the impact, when you see the the alternative where the emperor is like, here, let me. You know, you're getting one free revival. Let me pay for two more. And, and while we're at it, let me pay for three more. And so they're getting six forces out when normally three is the limit. You know, if if Tlilaxu are not in the game uh, and if they are in the game, that means the emperor can do even more. So that uh, especially if they've got if they've got the money. Yeah, you, you can say, look, you um, I need you to risk a lot of forces in this battle. Um, but don't worry, I can help you get. <laughs> a lot of them back out and uh that's uh that's going to be worthwhile and their leader mix is is also pretty good i mean they they've got fenring and a ramsham who are six and a five and that's that's a pretty good number for a leader um and then the other three i mean kate and bursig that's they're both threes three's not it's not terrible it's not great and basher's a two you know that that's that's their low guy um 
you know, if you add them all up and average them out, they're they're doing they're doing pretty well overall in the leader category. So Fenring and Ramshan both make really attractive traders. Um, so if the emperor happens to know <laughs> that one or either of them is a safe leader, um, that's really effective because uh, if you can if you've got a safe Fenring and you've got Sardaukar and you've got spice to spice dial. Um, you're going to win a lot of battles, even if you don't have the right weapon and um, defense you know, combination, uh, you know, the perfect combination for that. You don't necessarily have to kill the other leader. You can just overwhelm them with the forces. So uh, the, it, the emperor is definitely a contender. It's a strong faction. Um, so being simple doesn't mean weak uh, at all. Exactly. And, and with regard to the leaders... Um, I did a little bit of the math, and they have the third. If you took all the rankings of the leaders of each faction, they have the third best. They're right behind the Fremen and the Bene Gesserit. Um, Ekaz and Moritani can fluctuate depending if uh, Vidal is available, yeah. but they have to work to get that leader. Yeah. But if you just start straight off the bat, Emperor's third in line. We like to um, joke about the uh, the emperor's ancestral homeland move of shipping a bunch of forces down into Habania siege. And I was going to ask you, Chris, if that is a common opening move for you or anyone else that you typically play Dune with. I almost never jump to Habania Ridge at the beginning. What I prefer to do um, when I play the emperor is I like to do nothing. I like to wait. I, you know, in the game, it says that one of the weaknesses of the Emperor is they have to act before they're ready and ship all their troops down. But I prefer to wait and just hang out in outer space with my, with my troops and my Sardaukar and let other people get on the board, get into battles, get killed by the storm and worms. And when it's most opportune for me, then I can strike. And it also gives the emperor a lot of leverage, particularly if they have a lot of money. When you have a lot of people that are beginning to get down and out and the tanks begin to fill, and you're sitting up in orbit with all of your troops and they know you have loads of money, that gives you a lot of, that makes you a big threat in the game. Yeah. And when homeworlds are not involved, then they can't <laughs> touch those troops and you get to pick and choose your battles. And that's how I like to play. So I may go three, even four rounds depending on conditions before I even think about shipping troops down. Yeah. That, that bribing people to get into battles and stronghold block, um, you know, is uh, just as applicable if the emperor is uh, not on the board as when, uh, they are on the board. Um, what do you, uh, Jaded and GJ, what, what, um, what's your preference in terms of the emperor? Um, you know, get on the board early or bide your time. I, I that, uh, oh, yeah. go ahead. I think that's the first spot where I mean the emperor looks simple, but then is actually very complicated in practice. I mean, you've got two wildly diverging strategies you could go: where you stay in orbit, you wait for people to whittle themselves down. I mean, Dune is a game where you win by very fine margins, and the amount you lose is huge. So you wait a couple turns, people are going to be weak. And then you, at full strength, with all your spice, you can just crush them. Or do you stake your claim early? You've got essentially 25 forces worth of strength to put on the board. You can drop some big stacks. People aren't going to want to attack you. And then a nexus happens. You've already got a stronghold. You can ally up with someone and maybe even go for a, a decisive win that turn. Those are two wildly different strategies that just come from having a lot of money and not starting on the board yet. Yeah, GJ. Yeah, it's the, it's the thing that makes Emperor interesting for me. The ability to either play Emperor as a completely military-focused fashion, you have strong leaders, you have the ability to ship in a lot of forces pretty much at any time you want, and you have Sardukars, which are really, really strong, and most other fashion don't even come close to their power. Or you can choose to play Emperor like a Magister Averter, just sitting in space and saying, well, how about you two fight over there? Just see who actually does something. You wait your time. You, you make a few connections, bribe a few people, 
get information from Atreides or whoever else may have any, and then strike when time is correct. And I don't think there are many other factions in the game that can do so such widely different strategies, and are both of them are completely viable. They work perfectly fine, depending on who you are, I guess. Um, we have seen crashes on Kartag on turn one and terribly, but other times they work perfectly and you win the game next turn. Yeah. But you may as well just wait a few turns and, and see how it goes. And Emperor is the one fashion that can do whatever he wants because he just can. Yeah, we were talking uh, uh, at a different occasion about why... Um, a lot why a lot of players do like to do the early emperor into habanya siege and with the base game factions you know the emperor is the one faction that doesn't start on the board at all and habanya siege is typically the one spot that is open so emperor players often feel like well that's my siege you know that's, that's don't, everyone else is already somewhere else um i should go in there and there there are pros and cons i think for for Hobanya. um one is that it, it probably is going to be open so you can get in there you don't necessarily have to get into a turn one fight because even if you do have a full hand you don't necessarily want everybody to know what you have in your hand um you know other than maybe a tradies and if you've got a good pocket card that you were dealt at the start of the game um, you want to keep that secret for as long as possible, um, you know, and it's it's isolated. So it's the hardest stronghold to get to for most factions most of the time. Um, but that's one of the reasons why it's kind of a downside. There's only one spice blow that you can easily get to. Don't have the ornithopters unless you also happen to ship into one of the cities. So you can't really get anywhere from Habanya Siege. Uh, you're kind of stuck out there. And... Um, Maybe as the emperor, you don't necessarily need to send 10 forces down there. Maybe just a, uh, you know, maybe for a regular one, Sardaukar. That might be enough of a deterrent to uh, leave people alone so that you can uh, have a foothold on the board. Uh, maybe you want to get down there early in the turn order just as a deterrent to prevent somebody else from getting a sneaky turn one win. Um, but uh, I, I agree with Chris. I think there's a lot to be said about... Uh, not going in and when you do go in you you go where you want not where it's you know convenient just because nobody else is there um the, you know, the all of the other strongholds you've got generally speaking some better spice options nearby especially of course the two cities you can get to a lot of spice from arakeen and carthag and um just having that three three territory movement is a pretty big deal so if I'm going to be the emperor, I would much rather have my big introduction to Arrakis be on the uh, top side of that map. Um, and, go ahead. Oh, the other thing I'll say about avoiding Habanya Siege as the emperor, and of course, all anything I say comes with a caveat is it depends on the conditions of the game. Yeah. Is the one group that can readily reach Habanya Ridge Siege is the Fremen. Yeah. Oh. Uh, they could reach it on turn one if they chose, depending on where they place their troops. And as the emperor, that's the one faction you don't want to fight. <laughs> yeah, even if even if they put all of their forces in False Wall South or or Tabor, um, they even on turn one they can just show up in Habanya and then bloop bloop move right into Habanya Siege, uh, Habanya Erg to the Siege, or they can just spawn right there in False Wall West. Um, so, yes, they can get right into that uh, stronghold if they wanted to. And if you've gone all in with Sardaukar, um, they're useless against the Fremen. And um, so, yeah, that's that's the one faction you don't want to tangle with uh, with that. Speaking of Sardaukar, let's let's talk a little bit about best best practices with your with your Sardaukar. You have the five Sardaukar. The Fremen only have the three uh, Fadaikin, but. Um, they, you know, they, they, they do a pretty good job with just those three starred forces. Now the Fremen, uh, the, the Emperor's got five of them, um, but he does have that limitation of only being able to revive one each game turn. Um, can't even use the Tleilaxu Gola card to get another one out. Just stuck with the one. Um, you know, you can use your free, re one free revival as the Emperor to get that Sardaukar out. But if you've got three or four or five Sardaukar in the tanks, you're only getting one out. So 
Chris, do you like to bunch up your Sardaukar, spread them out? What's what's your general approach? Not to you know to give away all your secrets, but you know it's it's going to leak anyway, so you might as well tell us. <laughs> I would say that my preference, uh, generally, unless the game dictates otherwise, is if you put a small stack of regular troops in a in a territory with a couple of Sardaukar. Psychologically, I found that those two Sardaukar act as the deterrent. You know, they see four or five regular troops and a couple of starred. That makes them less likely to be attacked by other people. So I generally like to spread them out, you know, have use them to augment my regular troops. Yeah. What about you guys? And, well, I think that... Um... There's two ways you could kind of go with it. You could try to have like one in every group of forces you have on the board. And that way, you know, one big defeat won't put most of your starter car in the tanks. And also, anytime you do lose forces, you're going to have the option to lose the starter car so that you can then use your one free revival on that starter car. It's a bit of a waste if you're playing Emperor and you have a revival phase and you don't have any starter car to revive, just normals. That's a bit of like an inefficiency. But you could also use them as a sort of a pseudo guild rates and uh, half price dialing. Is if you ship all five to a territory, that's technically 10 strength of forces, but it only costs you five spice. And then when you're dialing them, again, 10 strength, but you only need to spend five to get up to that number. And me, who likes to play my self named Broke Emperor strategy, Sometimes you're, you're just you're right in the line if you have exactly enough spice to do what you want to do. And that cheaper shipment with Sardaukar is just like, like a godsend. That's a, really good, oh, that's a really good point. I would ship in, you know, four or five Sardaukar into a single territory if it involved a battle that I really wanted to win. And even then, I want to be sure. The last thing I need is someone, my my opponent showing up with a laser gun and shield, and then, yeah. then I'm screwed. <laughs> I really like the deterrent aspect of this art because, like, you don't have a lot of them. You have five. It's still more than Fremen, but you don't have 20 of them. Just spreading two, three of them around, it's already four or six strength, which is more than most people will send in a single stronghold just to put their foot down. And people would not really like fighting you with two tokens in one single place. I don't know what it, is it about it, but if I see two tokens of a single faction in one single stronghold, it immediately looks way worse than it probably is. Same works for X for me. If I see cyborgs and cyboids in the same place, I immediately tell, well, this is going to be a tough one. Even if it's just like four strength or whatever. So those Sardukas can really work your way, even by just doing nothing, even if you never actually use the fights, because people might not really want to engage with the threat of the double strength forces. And that also works in your favor, since you don't really want them to die anyway. So even if you don't end up dialing or using them, you still pressure people to ship more, to spend more, maybe to dial those extra troops more they would not want to otherwise. And all you did is just send a couple more in plus one single stronghold, and that's it. Cost you two spice and will cost the enemy a lot of overthinking and probably spe overspending. Yeah, I like I like to have at least two to Sardaukar in my reserves most of the time so that I know for two spice, boom, I'm adding four, four potential strength to any particular situation. And I think that that's... That's what I like to remind people of, right? the bringing the social aspect in. I'll say, like, look, I've got three Sardaukar up here sitting on the Highliner. Um, don't make me send them down because you're not going to like how that's going to turn out. And, yeah, having that, having that mix um, is, uh, is, is usually enough to give somebody pause. <laughs> and so unless they know something you don't know um, – uh, when all things being equal, they're like, yeah, let somebody else fight the Emperor here. Um, he's got five regular, two Sardaukar in that stronghold. Could drop down three more on his turn. Um, that is just, that that's somebody else's headache, not mine. 
and um, it's it's nice to be in that situation, um, which most of the time the emperor, uh, if if they choose to be, they certainly can be. Any other uh, any other fun tidbits uh, about playing the emperor and uh, leveraging those two very simple, straightforward faction advantages? I would like to mention alliances, mostly for the incredible trap that the emperor can fall into, <laughs> which is making an alliance they don't really gain much from. You. At least for me, you as an emperor really want to ally with Atreides, Bene Gesserit, maybe the Harkonnen, but someone who has a really strong military presence that can really benefit from your wealth. But at the same time, you don't want to do it too early or be too eager to give them spies, because the last person you can trust on a game of Dune is your own ally. Everyone else can you can make binding deals with, your allies you cannot. So if you buy them cards, if you let if you feed them too much and you don't gain anything from it because you don't have a good position in that moment, or you just just not an opening yet, you can get screwed over quite hard. So in my opinion, be careful and try to find someone that it will help you leverage your wealth in a actual combat way, but, it, but also do not fear not aligning early on if you see that there's no win attempt possible. There will be worms later on that you can easily make an alliances in yeah that's a really important point you have to you have to worry about how much you give your ally uh, at, at, at each turn because their spice is one of the strongest alliance abilities but kind of like a really tasty dessert once you've had your fill it's not very appealing anymore you know <laughs> once someone has forces on the board and cards in their hand they're going to ditch the emperor for someone that can give them an ability that they value more like the BG or the Atreides. So you give your ally too much uh, too much slack and they might just ditch you before you win. I would say that uh, I agree. Another faction which I think really complements the Emperor very well is House Riches. Because one of Riches's alliance ability is they can give one of their special cards that's in their hand to their ally at any time as long as their hand's not full. So the Emperor can work out a very equitable deal with Riches saying, put up the Delanthropy box or the Stone Burner up. I'm gonna give you the spice to, to make sure that we guarantee the win and you give it to me. And then the next round, you can get whichever card up for bid that you want and I'll fund it. And you can work out a very good symbiotic deal with that. Yeah. Riches also can offer you no globes, which the Emperor puts a no globe down, and you know they have Sardaukar up in outer space. That's also a really powerful tool against your adversaries. Yeah, another cheap shipment. Um, even if you're just, even if the rich S is like, I can only give you down uh, three for the price of one. Three Sardaukar is, um, that's plenty. <laughs> that's plenty right there that they can take advantage of. So, um yeah, it's. It, it, I I agree. I, I I do love this synergy that they they that those two factions, if they are of uh, like minds, um, and that's a. I think that's a pretty good deal. The emperor gets a really good card, and then um, then the then the rich s fills up his hand. So it's uh, it's win win, and um, you know it's probably the best deal the emperor is going to get <laughs> in the bidding phase. Um, and absolutely avoid allying yourself with the Moritani at all costs. You're going to fill up their <laughs> hand, and then they're just going to break that alliance the minute someone yep. triggers one of their uh, terror tokens. <laughs> I've I've seen that actually a lot. So yeah, you're absolutely right. You can't trust that Moritani faction at all. They they are looking for reasons to just screw over whoever <laughs> runs across their path. Um, so yeah, I think um, I think there's some good stuff in here. Um, that um, somebody new to the Emperor and even somebody who's played it quite a few times, um, giving them some good food for thought. Do we have any of their last thoughts? Because I do want to bring up a couple other things uh, in this particular episode before we run out of time. But yeah, last, last thoughts on the Emperor? Any uh, final well, bits of wisdom? I'd like to give a little bit of a... This is a probably more advanced kind of bit of advice, but um, with regards to Emperor bribing people, or just generally emperor watching people gain spice like 
uh, from Spice Flows. Because you gain the money from bidding, and bidding is one of the most uh, tempting ways to spend spice, you can, uh, you can bribe people a lot more to do things. You can be like Emperor hiring mercenaries and say, hey, Atreides, seven spice, go attack the Harkonnen. And then, you know, nine times out of ten, the Atreides are going to spend most of that spice on buying more cards. And it's just going to come right back to you as if you never lost it. And the other thing is that, you know, maybe your Emperor going last and you see like a Fremen, for example, collecting spice uncontested. Any other player might be tempted to go and harass them, but as Emperor, there's no point because for Fremen especially, all the spice they collect to you, all the spice they collect there is going to go right back to you in bidding, since that's the only thing they can spend it on. So that bidding advantage is, is great for bribing people spice, and and really it's an incentive to be more generous with your deal making. Yeah. And, and I would say that outside of bribes, when it comes to shipping treachery cards um i do advocate being frugal with the emperor because you can end up overspending and then find yourself in a bad position and along with that when i play the emperor the one card in the treachery deck that i fear someone else getting the most isn't the lays gun it's a mall <laughs> that can just wipe out half my funds and if you do that by the third or fourth round, then you start hitting those dog days in fifth and sixth when people spend a lot less on, on treachery cards because their decks are full, you can end up in a very bad position financially. Yeah, I actually made a deal with the Atreides once in the game where, as Emperor, I said, look, you know, right, right on the first turn, I said, I'm going to bribe you three spice right now. Um, and when a mall is up, you let me know. And if I end up buying it, I will bribe you another three spice. Um, and they're like, oh, you know, and sometimes there's some negotiating, but yeah, having, knowing where that card is or uh, being, you know, the one who has it is, is pretty important for the emperor. Um, you can sometimes bribe somebody to not play it until you give them the A-OK. -okay. Uh, because if you're doing the uh, broke emperor approach that Jaded likes, which is uh, try to end every turn down to two spice, so um, nobody knows that you are are close to being broke, but you're just going to build up your wealth again uh, in the following turn, uh, generally pretty well with the bidding, um, especially if there's another economic faction in the game. Uh, then yeah, the the spice will flow back into your coffers for sure. But um, yeah, that's uh, that's definitely a good thing to think about. All right. Well, on the day that we are recording this, um, there was an announcement from Gale Force Nine that um, they are coming out with a special deluxe edition of this Dune board game um, that they're going to launch on GameFound early next year, 2025, and they're calling it the Quisas Hatterack Edition. Um, they didn't give a lot of details about uh, what's involved, um, just that, you know, they, I think that John Paul mentioned uh, a 3D board and uh, really nice components. I don't know if there's going to be any kind of an uh, art overhaul um, or if it's, you know, if there will be multiple uh, approaches. Uh, they are saying that there's a another expansion. So I don't expect a lot to change. And when we say it's a, it's a new edition, I don't expect any rules changes as well. I think it's just a just deluxe edition of the current version of Dune, um, probably with some, uh, maybe a bigger, bigger board, um, more 3D tokens, maybe stackable forces. That would certainly be what I would be interested in, um, you know, future pastimes didn't know that this announcement was coming out. So we're as just as, uh, as shocked and amazed and delighted as anybody else. So I thought it might be fun to just, again, uh, since we'd all be speculating at this point to just kind of think about what sorts of stuff do you hope to see in the Quisas Hatterack edition? I, I think because they've got a, a, almost a year, maybe a whole year before it even launches, um, Gale Force 9 very much uh, is likely to still be in the process of, uh, process of deciding exactly what to put in there. So this may be a good chance for uh, fans to have some input on uh, what they want to see. And, 
you know, uh, right off the bat, I, you know, a new rule book, I think, is is a certainty, um, maybe a comprehensive one that has all of the uh, variants and expansion elements just in one rule book. Um, and the other thing that I will say is solo mode is off the table. There's not going to be a solo mode, so don't don't even ask for it. Uh, it's not going to you know, already on the game found page. People are like solo mode. And um, I just don't I don't really think that's going to happen. Uh, the original designers um, were not interested in a solo mode for Dune. It would it would be it would be its own year long project just to sort out and test and uh, figure out. And we kind of feel like a board game like this is a, is a social ex experience. It's meant to be played with other people, a lot of other people, preferably. Um, we like higher player counts, so. Uh, I think maybe some more rules on plus six games for those who want to do it. Um, but le let me turn it over to you, Chris. Why don't you start off? I mean, you're the you were the last one in our little group here to even hear about this. Um, you know, maybe we should give you more time to think. But I'm putting you on the spot. So if you if you were putting together and they said we want a Funky Grognard to uh, lead the effort on uh, the deluxe edition of Dune, this is just after you posted your uh, storage solution. Um, but um, yeah, let, let me you know let me hear a couple of things, and then we'll we'll hear from uh, GJ and Jaded as well. I think the three things I would want to put in a deluxe edition, if it's based on the current game, yeah, one would be a comprehensive rule book that would have you know all the variants, all the factions, uh, a timeline of play. That's so I'm not flipping through three or four different rule books. I think it would be neat if it had. Three more 3D figures for everything. And I would say, think about a game like Axis and Allies. Maybe you have, you know, a little soldier for one troop, something that looks like a tank for five troops, and then, you know, an, an ornithopter for 10 troops or something like that, where you have more 3D images, a more vibrant looking Shai Halud, um, a storm that clicks into the board and rotates around. I think that would be really, really neat. And of course, player faction cards that include their special Karama power. <laughs> yeah, I think that think that's a must. I think um, redoing the faction sheets, you know, and with maybe some rewording on some stuff, some going through the FAQ and saying, all right, you know, why do we have all of these questions about this? Uh, can we solve them by phrasing a few things differently and clarifying some things on the faction sheets? Maybe go with a slightly larger, a uh, an Ekaz Moritani sized <laughs> faction sheet that um, you know fits everything on there. So you're like, all right, great, it's all here. Absolutely, you got to have the special Karama effect on there. I think probably you don't necessarily need the alliance thing on the faction sheet since you have that separate alliance card. Um, you know, so that information is readily available. Um, and you know, if you, if you've handed it to your ally, you can be like, let me see what I can do, what I'm doing for you again. And, you know, in case you need to read it again, but yeah, that you'll save some room there. Um, and yeah, I, you know, it, it's interesting. I don't know the, my thought on the different types of forces is my question would be, what does it, does it lock you into uh, a certain, uh, like, oh, I have to do five if I've got this five unit thing, or do you have uh, a lot of excess forces? And then you just have to make sure you haven't exceeded 20 in terms of what you've got on the board. That would be interesting to, to think about and experiment with. Um, let's, let's get some more input. So, GJ, I know that you've thought about this uh, for quite a while. Um, let, let me hear, you know, your top three or so things that you would want to see in the Deluxe Edition. Um, that doesn't include any major rules changes per se. Uh, my main biggest one, mostly being in contact with so many new players from the Dune Table of Discord, is a good rulebook that also has a really good uh, onboarding experience. Something that can be used to teach new people how to play. Because the rules are really not that complicated. Like, after all, the game looks hard, but it really isn't at its core. It's just written in a really hard to parse way. So something to actually help that first two or three games would really, really be appreciated. Then all the goodies, like bigger board, please make territories actually usable. Like, Bite of the Cliff is basically unusable. Windpass North, the same. 
even though it has a spice blow, which is silly, in my opinion, but make it so that two or three fashions can comfortably sit there. I, the one component I would love is a force token that looks and behaves like the Cosmic Encounter ships, so that you can easily stack them on top of each other, they will not fall off, you can easily pick two or three up without any issues, they look amazing on the board, they would be really different colors, so you don't have contrast issues with Fremen or Guild, as I've heard some people say on the board. Just some more quality of life stuff, more than anything. The small things people have complained more than understandably about for the last years really make this experience a little less... Well, I endure this because the game is really good, but more like I actually enjoy touching these components and playing with this in the board. Yeah. Those little things would really enhance the experience. I saw when we were at Gen Con, um, Fat Buddha had his uh, deluxe components and bling for Dune, and he has he has individual Force uh, 3D guys that um, it does look great. But I think for me, I don't I, it, I I think it would feel too fiddly with just trying to pick up and move and like oh, I'm bringing these guys in, and then you know the the footprint that they would have on territories is pretty pretty big after a while and so you would need he has a pretty big map so it depends on how big gale force 9 would be willing to go i think at, at the end of the day uh, stackable force tokens is certainly more appealing to me but I, I would i'm absolutely still open to looking at um other things that that could be done and uh because i do I, I want it to be luxe but i also want it to be practical and easy and um, fun and you know doesn't take an extra 20 minutes to play just because like let me get these guys out there one at a time and uh, uh you know I, I tried to bring out a stack of five of them and then uh, they kind of scattered and so they're all over simpo and haga basin and i'm trying to get them all to fit into carthag with the terror token and an ambassador um jaded what about you uh it's the deluxe dune the quizzats hatterack um what is in that giant giant box well, I'm sure they could make space in that giant box for some tokens that stack easily because that cannot be <laughs> overstated. <laughs> As, having played the last four years, like 99% on TTS, that is the most apparent difference between playing in person is just how easy it is to knock over these stacks of forces. It, it literally does feel like shut up and sit down said, like you're moving around stacks of fingernail clippings. They just... They fall, and then it takes forever to stack them back. And then you ask someone, oh, how many is that? And they pick it up, and they accidentally drop them, and it's just, it's a nightmare. That would be great, because I play Cosmic all the time in person. I never have issues with that. Um, yeah, I've got I've got the, the token, you know, the plastic insert things. You stick the tokens in, and that is a big help. It doesn't make them stackable. Uh, and I have seen somebody online who is experimenting with a 3d printed insert that does have a stackable element to it um, but just those inserts it does make them easier to pick them up because it makes them bigger and they're it's nice and tactile so i like i like that direction but yes um you had some other uh, items possibly that yes. we haven't already discussed <laughs> well i for one would really love a nice uh robust built-in atreides tracker uh like maybe some sort of like magnetic board with like tokens that represent different cards and you can fly them around between different faction areas or like a discard area or even just like a, a nice looking board with a marker you could write on and erase or you know just just something some sort of built-in method to track cards as atreides yeah. because God knows that that sheet of paper, once you're done, a, a ten-turn game looks like the ramblings of <laughs> somebody who's not all together with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I could see it as an as an add-on. I don't know that they necessarily would say, "Hey, you know, this is this is included in there," uh, but it's an add-on that I think a lot of people would get, and uh, especially if it had, you know, if it's a magnetic board, but it has, you know, the faction logos are already built in. Um, or at least, you know, you had, you know, magnets that you could say, all right, I just need these six magnets for the six factions we're using. And, um, 
you've got a little organizer for it. And uh, so that might be fun. The dry erase uh, approach, I think, would work, too. That's what I'm starting to use now. Um, but I, I, it's got a completely, you know, white um, board on it. I might try to get some stickers to stick on there to just give it more of a dune feel. Um, but I, I like that idea. Anything else? What else you got in your bag of tricks? Yeah. Well, I would love to see uh, the cards and the player sheets get a bit of a cosmic treatment with how they got that uh, timing bar on the bottom. It tells you when you can play it, if it's mandatory, if it's optional. Um, just a nice uh, reference that looks exactly the same on everything, just like how Cosmic does it. Because with how crazy that game is, you know, a reference that is the same on every component it's on and tells you very clearly how it works, it really helps with a lot of rules questions. And Dune is on a pretty similar level at this point with all these expansions that you know if it tells you with clear symbology when you can use this ability and and what it does or when you play this card that would be awesome yeah having some, go ahead go ahead chris i think something that might help with the atreides tracker and something that would be a good element for the quetzal tatarak edition and i see other games doing this is to come out with a companion app that you could download. Um, you know, you buy the game and it says, you know, scan this QR code and it gives you an app that has a rules that you can readily search and it even comes with a built-in tracker. Yeah, that I, would be great, honestly. I'd be, no I'd, be, I'd be good with both of those as being available. If you want to go analog, here's, here's, here's one solution and here's a digital one. There's already a couple of people who have been working on just those apps. And I think Gale Force 9 could easily do uh, an, an other, another Ilya where the, you know, the artwork for this edition had been previously put online for free by um, Russian artist Ilya, who, who was just like, if you want to print and play your own version of Dune, which at the time was unavailable for purchase anywhere, and they, they approached him and said, look, we want to license all of your artwork and go to press much more quickly. Um, with this edition, and so they could, I think they could easily approach some of these um, app developers and say, "Look, we want to officially license it, and uh, we'll we'll make it available um, to anybody who picks up the game." Um, I think that would be a worthwhile uh, thing to investigate because um, it it is pretty handy. Some of those apps I've looked at, um, I was like, "Yeah, this is great." There's one that was just completely web based, and um, so yeah, I'm tempted to bring it up on my laptop. Although having you know having a laptop there at the table is not always practical. So, but having options so you know it, to whatever your particular g gameplay style and uh, access accessibility options are um, would be great. It'd be nice that they could offer like here's a couple of ways you can approach this as a tradies, and um, it really jazzes up and uh, makes the ultimate experience uh that much more enjoyable and and streamlined anything else what else we got out here maybe Pretty they could good. introduce oh i'm sorry mm. go ahead all right it's just I, I would just love stuff to make the game easier to play like more more accessible and more enjoyable to literally touch and have the communal experience with that that's about it for me Chris and the built-in storage component, you know, just you buy it and you have everything you need to store everything it comes with. Yeah. Nice handy little here. You're playing Atreides. Here's a little box. It's got everything in it that you need. Um, and then that's where it all goes when it's done. Um, pull out a, you know, I've got, I've got this little spice box that is shaped like the spice bank here. Um, which is really only sized for the actual Gale Force 9 board, although now I play it on a double-sized play mat, so I really wish I had a bigger spice bank. But if they could have a little tray where it's like, psh, there it is, there it all is, um, a nice, you, you've stored it all in there. You don't have to get it out and put it in separate containers, the spices, um, which kind of, I kind of did with, uh, with the Arrakis board game, which has a really nice storage system in that, in that box where you just pull that whole tray out and everything is there you don't need to then pull stuff out of the out of the storage and then set it around the board it's all it stays in its little storage thing but you can pull that out of the box 
so it's not taking up as much table space and that's got all your resources in it and it's got all of your developments and so i think stuff like that some modular trays and uh and things for uh making setup and cleanup that much quicker and easier absolutely yeah. yeah, the biggest challenge in Dune is not trying to predict treachery or win a battle or hunt for spice. It's just Store. organizing and storing everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and everybody wants one box. Uh, they're like, oh, I can't. I don't want to put stuff in these expansion boxes. I want everything to fit in the base box. And it's a tall order for sure. Um, yeah, there, it can be done, but man, it's uh, it takes a lot of work. Um, I would love for them to see to say, yeah, we want to put in some exclusive new factions. So they don't have to be exclusive because you could just you can do the game found option of like I, I just want the new stuff. And uh, and you know someone might say, well, are, are there new factions? And my answer is, there's always new factions. Um, so <laughs> so yes, there could easily be some new factions that uh, do some really interesting and innovative. And cool things. I say like it's something that I've play tested, and maybe I have, maybe I haven't. I like to be <laughs> a little bit ambiguous when I talk about uh, development. But um, yeah, there's and you know they announced as part of it. They announced that Spice Harvest is part of this uh, new expansion's worth of material. They said there's a new expansion that will be part of the game found, um, and Spice Harvest is in there. So I can I can tell you that it is. Um, this is not your father's Spice Harvest, um, although it, it's very similar to the classic Avalon Hill Spice Harvest expansion for Dune, but it has been improved in a uh, variety of ways, and um, and there's a variety of ways to use it, and that's really all I can get into at this point, but um, that's really only half of what's in that expansion. So at some point, Gale Force 9 will give me the green light to really talk about the other stuff that we know is part of it. Um, but it is very exciting. And as we were designing it, we were wondering how in the world it was going to be stored. And now we know it's going to be part of a massive storage solution. And so if anyone is familiar with the Firefly campaign that Gale Force 9 did on GameFound, which is they they put out a storage solution for Firefly and its many, many expansions, including a lot of new material, Um that they had fans involved in designing. And so I don't know if that will be a part of the Dune Kwisatz Haderach uh, experience, but that crate, that Firefly crate, it's beautiful and it, it does organize everything in a really interesting way. And I think it excited a lot of the Firefly fan base quite a bit. Um, and they've been receiving it now for the past week or so. Um, and that's that's what this Dune Kwisatz uh, edition is going to include is a really nice big storage solution, um, which I, I imagine they're still in the process of figuring out what it's going to look like. Um, maybe it'll be a giant shy halud and uh, you open its mouth and shake everything out. Um, like that popcorn thing. I'm, I'm going to get as many of those popcorn Ambulous. things as I can next week, Chris. I'm going to tell you that. I'm not going to have relations with the bucket, but I will I will be using it um, in uh, as many interesting and unusual ways Um safe for families uh, and children um, as possible. Uh, all Dune ways, by the way. I'm not going to, like, wear it as a hat or anything like that. But, yeah, yeah. Whenever troops get devoured by the worm, just toss them in the bucket. Ex absolutely. Uh, With the popcorn. The <laughs> mechanic. If you can toss it from across the room into the bucket, you get an extra free revival. That's right. Lovely. <laughs> and it's the spice bank as well. Some, some caramel corn. You dive your hands. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how you get popcorn out of that thing without scratching your hands. I guess we'll find out as I am I am getting one. Um, yeah, and I, I guess we'll you know, wrap things up. We have a couple more minutes, but um, uh, I just watched the uh, Lynch Dune, the 84 Dune in the theaters with my family. And I saw it when it originally came out in 1984 as a teenager. Um, so it wasn't my first time seeing it in the theater, but it is better in the theater. It doesn't make the movie better, but it's better watching it. And I still enjoy that movie quite a bit. I mean, that was the only Dune that we had for quite a while. Um, then we had the miniseries, which is, you know, has its own pros and cons. And, and I've got that on DVD, so I watch it periodically as well. Um, on the plus side for Lynch, what I will say is that it is so quotable. And I was quoting it as the dialogue was happening on screen until my wife 
um, it said, I will kill you. And uh, so I stopped with that, although I still did the big lines like, mm, Shai Hulud, and it is the legend, and I wish it. So I, I did all those things out loud. And uh, so, yeah, it's very quotable. On the downside, you know, I, I laughed out loud when at the end when Princess Irulan was saying, where there was war, Muad'Dib would bring peace. And I was like, did uh, Lynch not read the end of that, uh, or read the next book? Because that's not really how it ends. But um, And then, of course, he makes it rain, which is like, oh, I guess you're just going to kill all the sandworms now <laughs> with your ability to make it rain on Arrakis, which also doesn't happen. Um, but, yeah, I mean, what do you, what do you guys? You, know, you guys are all younger than me, so... Um, you know, Chris, did you see Dune in the theaters when it first came out? Uh, I did see Dune in theaters when it came out in 84. And my very first Dune board game was the Avalon Hill bookcase game with the fake sting, which I still have. Yeah, that's what I have as well. Yes. And and, and I have a love for that movie. I mean, it's not as good as the new Denis Villeneuve movie, but it's just so gonzo crazy you know with the antidote cat and sting in his magic underwear and <laughs> the infernal monologues it, it's and of course the cackling maniacal harkonnens uh, or harkonnens as they say yes, in the movie Harkonnen. It, it's just so nutty it's enjoyable but the one thing i will give it credit for that it does better than the villanuve movie is it actually sets up yui as a traitor where in the Villanueva movie just kind of comes out of left field. Yeah, I agree. Uh, there, there's some, some stuff I like. You know, the big controversy when it came out, of course, was the weirding modules, which is um, a major plot point of the Lynch movie, which has nothing to do with anything. And my, my speculation is that when Lynch read Dune, um, one of the big things that stuck with him was the weirding way. And he was, and he, I think he felt like, I've got to have this as part of the movie but how do we depict it and i think he struggled with that and weirding modules is where he ended up with and i think probably just because he liked the name i think weirding is lynch's middle name um but yeah like the the miniseries they also felt like they had to have the weirding way as part of it and um they did try a different tactic it seems that uh the new movies uh you know denis doesn't seem to care about the weirding way at all um and and he so far, I don't know that they're necessarily going to, you know, imp incorporate that plot point from the book where the Fremen were like, we really need you to teach us this new form of combat, which I always found was a little bit weird. I didn't really understand why that was necessary. They they had pretty well established that the Fremen were the pretty much the best fighting force in the uh, in the Imperium without without the weirding way, you know, the Sardaukar descend on that siege and they're beaten down by women and children. And so I just don't think that Lady Jessica and, and Paul teaching them, um, you know, some extra form of physical uh, yogi style combat is, is taking them to the next level. So, um, yeah, the weirding way, it's just kind of a it's it, it's really elusive. No filmmaker has truly gotten their finger on it i think what about what about you guys I, um lynch movie we quote it all the time in the in our game so it's in fact it's part of the invitational you know when the quiz hot's hatterack is unlocked you have to you have to yell father the sleeper has awakened it's a rule so it's obligated <laughs> yeah exactly Carl wrote it down in the rules including other clarifications like actual rules clarifications yeah <laughs> i I love that movie. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> uh, not as a movie, but as a dude adaptation. It's so visually striking. I mean, the image of guild navigators that it created persists to this day. Mm -hmm. um, the way that the sandworm looks, again, persists to this day with the weird tri-petal mouth thing and all the quotes. It's, it's such a quotable movie. And while it strays from the book, in very obvious ways, like the rain and the weirding modules and the antidote cat, it <laughs> it still has a reverence to the book where it it plays out scenes word for word, action for action, and I mean my biggest problem with the Denny Villeneuve movie is that he just walks directly past like things people love about the Dune books and just ignores them, you know, like the banquet scene. Uh, 
it's kind of it's very much his Dune adaptation rather than a Dune adaptation, and I gotta respect it. And it's a great movie, it's the best movie to be made from a Dune, from Dune. But it's as a Dune adaptation, it's not my favorite. Yeah, it seems like a very faithful adaptation of somebody who read Dune many times, but not recently. And so they don't remember a lot of the real specifics, um, but they get the vibe. They're like, yeah, this happens. And some stuff here happens around this, which he mostly gets right. And so in a lot of the production elements, uh, the big focus, like, you know, he loves those ornithopters and who, who doesn't. And so um, that, that, that's, it's that same sort of thing. It's the stuff that stood out the most to him after reading it that he focused on in the movie. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of, you know, I focused on other stuff <laughs> that um, I, I was disappointed wasn't included, but I, you know, at the end of the day, I understand can't put everything in there. So you, you prioritize what was most important to you as a filmmaker, GJ, what you, I, any other uh, elements? I, I originally, when I first saw it, I kind of hated it because I, I expected a Dune movie, and it strays so much from the source material that I was kind of disappointed. But with time, I started appreciating the movie aspect of it. Yeah. Like, forgetting about how accurate the story it is, it's just such a visually striking experience. The, the thing that stuck to me, and still to this day, I kind of wish we had a reference in the game especially, was how shields look like. Those cues just moving around the character, fogging them up. Just the day looks so unique, so filled filled with everything, filled with power, with nuance, with elegance even. And the Villeneuve film is great. I really enjoy it, but it kind of lacks that. Like, kind of doesn't dare to do to go that one extra mile just to be completely bonkers and as Lynch did. Yeah, and. I think Lynch's movie will never be forgotten just for that exact reason. It's just so daring, so unique, so out of what you would expect. It, it's just an experience that even if you may not think you enjoy it, you will probably end up actually really liking it. All right. Well, last words, Chris, is before we wrap up, anything else you want to say? Um, one thing I do remember about the, the 84 movie w with regard to the weirding modules <laughs> I remember reading that David Lynch chose the weird sound weapons because he, quote, did not want to see Kung Fu in the desert. <laughs> yeah. I can I can feel it. There's a lot of guns and not a lot of knives in the, in mm -hmm. the battles. But, um, yeah. Well, that is all the time that we have for this episode of Battle Language. We will definitely invite uh, Chris back for another discussion at his leisure. It's an open invitation, Chris. And, um, yeah, well, there's there's a lot to talk about. We covered three topics in here, but we could have talked for hours on each one of them. Um, so thanks, everybody, for watching, and uh, we'll see you again soon.